Hi, my name is Kimberly Hobbs, and I live in Conception Bay South, Newfoundland and Labrador. I have a Master of Science degree in Biology from Memorial University, and I work for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. For the last 25 years, I've been studying fish and aquatic invertebrates, and I'm always amazed at the variety of the over 34,000 species of fish and their adaptations to life underwater. One of these adaptations is their ability to swim up and down in the water column without sinking to the bottom or floating to the surface. There are two forces acting on objects submerged in water, gravity and buoyancy. Whether the object sinks or floats depends on which is greater. Gravity is the force that acts on objects with mass to pull them down. Gravitational force is also called weight. The heavier an object is, the more gravitational force acting upon it. Buoyancy is the upward force pushing against an object immersed in, in a fluid. The force of the buoyancy on the object is equal to the weight of the fluid that the object displaces. And this is directly related to the object's volume or how much space it takes up. The greater the volume, the greater the buoyancy force. If the object is less dense than water and it has a volume that's greater than its weight, it will float. The greater the volume, the more liquid is that is displaced and therefore the greater force of buoyancy. This is why it's really difficult to push a floating pool toy under the water. The volume is very great and so the force pushing up on it is also great. If an object is denser than water and its weight is compacted into a smaller volume, it will sink. In this case, the force of gravity is greater than the force of buoyancy. When the buoyancy force is exactly the same as the weight of the object, or the gravitational force on the object, the object has neutral buoyancy and is able to stay in its place without sinking or floating. Fish are denser than water, so why don't they sink? And how are they able to move up and down in the water column? There are four ways to achieve neutral buoyancy. The first is to incorporate low density compounds into your body, such as fats. Sharks have an extra large liver that has a lot of fat content, and this helps it maintain its buoyancy. This strategy limits the shark to a saltwater habitat because fresh water is less dense than salt water. And this is why it's easier to float in the ocean than on a pond. In order to remain buoyant in fresh water, a shark would need to have a liver eight times larger. The average fully grown great white shark would need a two ton liver to stay buoyant in fresh water. That's twice as big as they are. The second way to achieve neutral buoyancy is to increase your movement just keep swimming. Sharks and rays ascend and descend by propelling themselves forward. The movement of the water under their fins creates lift, similar to how the movement of air under a plane's wing creates lift for the plane. This is a good strategy, but it's metabolically expensive because swimming all the time takes a lot of energy. The third way to achieve neutral buoyancy is to reduce your weight in relation to your volume. Sort of like our little rubber ducky here. Deep sea fish have tissues that are, have a high fat content, they accumulate water, and their, skeleton, their skeletons are smaller, thinner, and have less mineral content than fish that live in shallower waters. This strategy allows them to become less dense but it also makes them slower and less agile than fish that live in shallow water. The fourth strategy for neutral buoyancy is the swim bladder. The swim bladder was one of the crucial evolutionary steps that allowed modern bony fish 
to expand into new habitats and to di diversify. The swim bladder is a gas filled sac that's located in the upper body cavity just below the spine. And it's like an air inflated balloon that expands and contracts depending on the amount of gas that's inside of it. In fact, you can use a balloon to simulate how a swim bladder works at home. For this activity, you will need a glass bottle, some tubing, a balloon, some waterproof tape that's strong enough to hold your tubing onto your bottle, some kind of container filled with water, it's best to have one that's transparent so that you can see your experiment in action. And it's always good to have some towels around just in case you have a spill. Okay, first we're going to assemble our swim bladder. Insert your tubing into your balloon and then tape it. You want to make sure that your seal is airtight so that you don't get any leakage of air from your balloon. So we'll just give it a little test now to see if it's leaking. Do have a bit of a leak. Okay, let's try again. Next, you're going to put your balloon inside of your bottle. The bottle is representing our fish here, and the balloon is its swim bladder. We're going to tape the tubing onto the neck of the bottle to secure it in place. Okay, here's our model of a fish. Place your bottle in your tank or your container and let's see what happens. Okay, as you can see it sank pretty quickly as the bottle filled up with water. So the weight of the glass bottle full of water um, and the gravitational force caused it to sink. So the gravitational force here was greater than our buoyancy force, so our bottle sank. Let's see what happens if we blow up our balloon. It floated. As the balloon inflates, you're increasing the volume and um, that displaces more water. Remember, if it has a higher volume, it displaces more, vol more water, so the force of buoyancy is going to be greater than the force of gravity, so it will come up. And of course, it sank back down again because I, I let out the air. Let's try again. Okay. Now with fish, they can inflate their swim bladders in two ways. The first way is to go to the surface and gulp some air, and then they force the air from their gut into their swim bladder. Other types of fish will actually remove air, uh, not air, but a dissolved oxygen from their bloodstream through capillaries in their swim bladder, and that will inflate the swim bladder. 
Now as the air came out of the balloon there, our bottle sinks again. So our bottle, the balloon is decreasing in volume, it's displacing less liquid, and therefore it sinks. Fish get the, uh, their air bladders too, or swim bladders too, to deflate either by pushing the air out similar to a burp or by letting that gas diffuse back into the bloodstream. So fish will then control where they are in the water column by adjusting how much gas is in their swim bladder. So let's see if we can try and get this bottle to uh, come not all the way to the top, but just a little bit. It's really hard to do. <laughs> really hard to control how much air is going in, but you get the general idea. So I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of one of the many adaptations that fish have to living underwater, and I hope you'll try this at home. Uh, try playing around with different types of bottles and different types of balloons. Uh, to see what happens. What would happen if you took a very small balloon and put it in a very large bottle or vice versa? What would happen if you used a plastic bottle instead of a glass one? To learn more about fish adaptations, see the books below. And to learn more about me, I invite you to check out my page on the WRDC website. And thank you so much for watching.